Hi everyone, I'm really excited um, to be uh, with you today and to present on student engagement. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen to share my PowerPoint. Give me just one second to set up. So uh, my name is Yaxenia Delgado Lorenzo and I um, work for a couple of districts. My primary home is Hacienda La Puente Unified. Um, and I've uh, taught in basically uh, almost everything. So I've done CTE, AVE, HSC, and ESL. Um, today what I'm presenting um, is really uh, best practices for student engagement in online learning. So what I really wanted to bring to you was more um, research-based and some of the best practices um, that uh, we know uh, work for our students. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote, and today's quote is, it's the engagement of learning that makes us alive. So as all of us know as instructors, um, you know, we uh, really bring um, something different to the classroom when we're teaching something and our students are able to be engaged. Um, so student engagement uh, is really the time and the energy students devote to education, um, educationally sound activities. So it is, um, what they're doing and how they're absorbing that information. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what are the behavioral components of um, student engagement. Um, and what I'll also do, um, I'm gonna go through some research and then we're gonna go through some of uh, the best practices as well as some of um, the different applications that we can use um, to engage our students. Um, so we know, um, as we consider the entire learning experience, both inside and outside the classroom, there are four factors illustrating how students devote time and energy in the classroom. So we know skills and engagement, so that's going to be keeping up with the readings, um, putting forth effort to apply themselves in the classroom, um, emotional engagement, so making the course interesting, applying it to their own lives, participation and interaction, um, having fun, participating actively in small group discussions or forums, and we also um, know performance engagement, which is doing well on the test or getting a good grade or, or doing something um, that gives them um, some type of performance achievement. So as we talk about student engagement, we know engagement involves students using time and energy to learn materials and skills, demonstrating that learning, interacting in a meaningful way with others in the class. Um, enough to where they know, um, as we teach online, we know that we're behind a computer. So sometimes that can seem a little bit abstract. So as they interact in meaningful ways with others in the classroom, um, it starts to become real to them. Those um, individuals behind the other computers start to become real to them and they become emotionally attached with their learning. For example, maybe getting excited about an idea or enjoying the learning or interacting even with their um, classroom teachers. The level of academic challenge is whether students are putting forth enough academic effort. As, um, as it is spent studying, reading, or preparing for the class. All five capacities, such as memorization, analysis, synthesis, and making judgment and application are prevalent in the online environment. So as we know, um, research shows that students are most engaged in analytical work. So let's go through some of them. Um, ideas for increasing engagement and some of the best practices. So the first one is to communicate in multiple um, formats. So we, online um, provides instructors with a lot of multiple avenues for communicating with students. Course email, discussions, forums tend to be the standard communications tools, but don't overlook the embedded audio, the video, the chat rooms or instant messaging even broadcasting a text message and then homepage announcements are also ways to communicate with our students. Um, one of the things that we can do is maybe a screencast explaining an assignment, um, 
tends to really be received well by students. So students really like it when they're able to see our face and make that connection. And um, a lot of the screencasts are really easy and inexpensive ways to um, get our students engaged. So here are some of the applications that we use for communication. Um, one of my favorites is actually Google Groups. So you can create a Google Group um, and it allows you to put um, all of your students' emails as part of a Google Group. And that way you can send an assignment or a reminder just like you would an email. So Google Groups really works um, as an email um, application. So rather than entering each um, recipient email address, you would just have a group and then everybody in the group would receive that same message. Um, and you also have other applications like Remind, um, Class Dojo, um, Simple Circle. I've seen um, some of our literacy teachers using WhatsApp um, or Twitter. Um, so these are just applications for communication that would allow you to communicate um, with your students and kind of send messages back and forth in an easy, um, efficient way. Um, so we also want to provide opportunities um, for active learning. A common misconception about online learning is that students only sit in front of their computers. Um, that might be true if the course is designed that way, but one way to engage online learners is to get them out of their chairs or out of their beds and get them involved in active learning. So one definition of active learning is hands-on learning, which is, um, something that we can create in our online environment by assigning students to maybe um, our ESL students to interview people working in the field or um, to maybe interview a family member. Um, otherwise, uh, maybe learning within the, throughout the community, going out to the grocery store, going out to the pharmacy. Um, Another way we can do this is by presenting case studies or group projects or gathering and analyze, analyzing local data. Um, so those are just a few examples. Um, some of the things that we can do to provide um, active learning opportunities and also kind of create um, group learning is by using um, some of the applications that are available. So maybe a screencasting. So when we see a screencasting, that's basically um, a video of yourself, um, like kind of like a selfie video that you're creating where um, you are recording yourself or you're recording the screen that you're working on. And that can be done um, through Google applications, which you can get for free, like um, for example, Screencastify or Loom. Google Docs um, is a way to create active learning. Um, you can set up a question and multiple students can log into that same Google Doc if you send the link to them and multiple students can work together in one document or maybe a group of students, maybe um, you know, one, uh, three students can work together in one document and create um, one document together. Um, another way is to create a webinar for them um, where you're presenting to them um, by sharing pictures, even through some of our messaging apps um, are also helpful and surveys. Um, there's an uh, application called Polls Everywhere um, that works well with surveys for your students. So um, just sending, um, you know, any type of uh, activity through them, any of these apps um, are able to be used for some of those activities. Um, we want to also um, encourage active and collaborative learning, um, which refers to the efforts of students um, to contribute to class discussions in the same way that they do in our face-to-face -face discussions. So work with other students and engage in other activities. The online classroom um, has commonly been referred as a learning community. So as we transition online, our learning community um, really becomes our on online platform and the students that we're servicing through the online. So implying um, the expectation is that the environment um, fosters that collaborative efforts that promote learning. Um, so just like in your class, there's always those students that are willing um, to talk to others or to, um, I'm sorry, to help other students, right? Like when somebody is stuck with technology, you're gonna have the same in your classroom and it's utilizing them um, 
to help us uh, throughout the class and to create that collaborative learning environment. So we can do this through peer um, tutoring, through the sharing of ideas. Um, in our higher classes, um, that works really well. Another way that we can also engage them is um, for our low level learners. Um, we wanna create um, games where they can work against maybe one another or you know, as a group. Um, so we have like picture card games, word games, which can be done through Quizlet, Kahoot, or Brainscape. Um, and all of these are just games where you create a classroom, um, share the link, and then students can um, practice uh, their vocabulary and kind of see other students in the classroom and compare their learning to other students in the class. And it's anonymous, so they can have like a screen name where they don't feel, um, you know, like we're disclosing their information, but um, it's kind of a way to see how they're doing and they get excited when they see, um, you know, that they're top of the list or third on the list, or maybe if they're 20th on the list, then they get a little bit um, more excited to see their name moving up. Um, you know, even providing online um, dictation from one student to another um, with vocabulary words. Um, we can, um, if we use, uh, the Zoom app, um, we can split our students up into small groups and have them do dictation to each other, where maybe they provide a word and the other students need to spell it. Um, and simple sharing of information, so asking those same simple questions that we would ask in class, we can ask those informations through our apps or through the um, message sharing applications as well. Yesenia, yes. Yesenia, sorry, this is Anthony. Yes, um, hi. Hi. So we had a question in the chat. Um, and just a reminder, uh, participants today, if you wouldn't mind, if you do have questions, go ahead and post them in the Q&A, which you'll find uh, there's a Q&A button along your Zoom, on your Zoom toolbar, um, and you can go ahead and post your questions there. Um, let me just, it was just one question, uh, Yesenia. So, the question was about, do you happen to know if, uh, and I have to find the question again. Do you happen to know if the Google Groups, you were talking about Google Groups in number one, mm -hmm. do you happen to know if the Google Group, interf uh, does Google Group interface with Outlook for group addresses? It does not, I, and I'm not sure if um, Outlook has its own function that's similar where you can kind of queue all of the email addresses together. Um, I've. I haven't done that in Outlook. Um, I've only used the Google group function. And I, um, for example, um, when the students reply, the whole group gets it. Um, so it's more of a group of emails set up together as part of that group to make announcements or to share, um, you know, lessons and stuff like that. Yeah, I think we've had, um, I, I'll just interject, you could, um, uh, maybe and maybe Melinda can chime in as well. Um, so maybe a po another possibility might be um, if you can grab your. I think the question is, you know, basically importing these emails into a Google group. So maybe if you downloaded um, your email list from, you know, ASAP or if it, what other whatever student information mm -hmm. system you're using, and then you could basically kind of cut and paste them into um, the setup for the Google group, and then that way you'd be able to get your student emails over into uh, to get started with your Google group. Yeah, especially, I love it because if you have like a really big class, like you can have up to, I mean, it's unlimited as far as how many emails you can have in there. So even if you have a hundred students in the class, um, it's just an easier way to keep everybody in the group. And as the instructor, if you're the manager of the group, you can go in and delete and add students um, at any time. Yeah, okay, that was the one question, thank you. Yeah, sorry, no, I'm not sure with Microsoft. Um, if anybody knows, please share um, if Microsoft has an option um, for us to group all the emails together. Um, so I think it was in number three, yes. <laughs> So um, we want uh, another way to create that engagement with your learners is to make learning social. Um, so don't be afraid to use social media. 
Um, if you're able to create that class account through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, a lot of our students are already um, in um, a social network. So we wanna take advantage of that. So many instructors um, are looking at social media as ways to spice up their courses and engage students in learning. Consider adding a Twitter badge um, to your course or your home page, and then using a hashtag to push post with course relevant content to your students. Um, social platforms is used effectively. If used effectively, can help build a sense of classroom community among the students and between students and instructors. So even if, um, you know, right now, if you, a lot of your students maybe use Facebook, um, if it's, um, if that's the social media platform that everybody's using, um, just seeing a, a post from your teacher um, with a little video, you know, with a link to maybe a program, uh, a free application that the students can use, those are really helpful to them. Um, so they do, uh, our students do use social media, so we can take advantage of um, what they use already. Um, gamify with badges and certificates. So we can, there's many ways for you to add um, gamification elements to online courses without going um, to the route of building a full game-based learning um, course from start to finish. Um, as more, um, as we more consider the badges, for example, if they're doing um, Quizlet and they got top number one spot on they were the fastest to do the matching and um, we create we can create digital badges for them and i'll show you a couple applications that this can be done through um, so the best badges are usually rewarding on an achievement um, for particular competencies um, so even for my students um, if i'm teaching them typing for example um, i have a group of students in cte that are doing typing so i send out um, a superstar to our three top typists um, so that encouraged them to kind of um you know i've had students tell me um you know i i was practicing for hours because i wanted to be part of that email so every um, once a week i send out an email to our top typist um, but I've also done it with vocabulary words for students um, because these programs are um, kind of tracking, for example, Quizlets tracks um, how fast they're matching on specific activities or how well they did on a quiz. Um, so that's definitely a, a way to motivate our students and it kind of promotes that public accomplishment to them. Um, so it really encourages them to work harder. So these are some of um, the badge apps that are available out there. Um, so Creedly basically uh, allows teachers to create badges. Um, you're able to upload your own design and um, and give credit um, through the through that platform. So that's um, one application that can be used. Um, one of my favorites is Mozilla Open Badges. So um, you can create and issue badges that do not um, have to be tied to any platform. Um, and like I said before, even just the picture that you're sending out in a text um, saying, you know, one student completed all of the activities this week or the whole unit um, helps out and you can create those through Mozilla Open Badges. Um, all Badges is another application. Um, and this one works in conjunction with rubrics. So if you have like a higher level um, ESL class or a higher level class and you're looking at competencies and there's a rubric for it, um, for all badges will kind of allow you to attach the badge with your rubric to it. Um, and then also take advantage of badges that are offered through your learning platform. Um, for example, Edmodo or Moodle or Blackboard. Um, those those um, learning um, platforms already have badges that are attached to it. Um, so for example, we use, um, Jacinda La Puente uses, um, Moodle through adultcourses.org um, with the help of OTAN, and we have putting English to work. So what we did is for the unit that the students completed, um, we're able to give them a badge. So if they completed our level one ESL students, if they completed all of the activities for um, unit one, then they would get the badge for unit one, and it could be anything from like housing or health. 
Um, so we uh, are able to create a sticker or a badge and then they get that badge once they complete that unit. So when they go into their profile, they see their badges of everything they've completed. So badges are always fun. Students like them. I like them myself personally as a teacher. So when I did take a course that gives a badge, it just kind of makes me feel proud when I get one. And I see some questions. So let me... Yesenia, yeah, I can, let me, um, we do <laughs> have a couple you. questions. So let's start with, um, let's go back to the Facebook for a second. So there was okay. a question about, um, can you give an example of how you would use Facebook in the online classroom or how do those two things interact? Um, so through Facebook, you're able to also create groups. So um, you can create a group um, where it's called, in Facebook, it's actually called groups and you create um, the class identification. So you would say, uh, Miss Delgado's ESL beginning one. Um, and then you would tell your students um, the name of the group and they would find it on Facebook and add it to their um, friends list. Um, so when you uh, post a message to that specific group, only those students will see it, even though you have your own um, Facebook account, um, once you create that group and you post directly into that group message, only that group of students will see it. So your students that are in that Facebook group don't have to personally be your friends. Um, they can just be a follower of that group. And for example, um, if you have a video on vocabulary that you created, um, a YouTube video or um, any type of video that it, it's like a little learning lesson, um, you can upload it in there. And then students are able to comment on the video just like they do in regular Facebook. Or if you wanna send out a worksheet to your students, um, it works the same way. You would be able to attach a worksheet. Um, say for example, you have a picture and it's a higher level class and you want them to write um, 50 words on that picture, then you would post the picture, provide your directions, and then the students would be able to comment and see each other's comments. Um, and it also works the other way where students are able to share with the group um, in Facebook. Um, so you can actually do groups for most of the social media platforms um, where you're just specifically targeting a group of students that is following that specific group. Okay. And Yesenia, the other uh, question for now is, um, you talked about your, C um, your CTE students and typing practice. Um, what's a good way to teach typing through distance learning? So the one that I use, and there's a couple of programs out there for typing, but I just use typing.com and it's a free program and it has lessons already embedded in it. So for example, um, you know, it starts with like J and F. Um, you know, as our two primary keys and students have to go in there and do the whole lesson. So it's kind of like a typing app um, and then students just go through the lessons. I, I think it goes from like beginning like very, very low, like you can't type until the higher level where they're taking a five minute typing test and then they can continue to challenge it to, um, you know, to get a higher typing score. And Yesenia, sorry, back on the Facebook group question, um, you, you mentioned that you would be able to upload um, files into the group. Are the students then able to download them? Yeah, And absolutely. print them if they would like? Yeah, they can download and print. So you would download it the same way that you download, um, you know, any um, PDF document or anything else. If you put a link in there, like say, for example, you did a Google form with a little um, activity for them that's matching or multiple choice, you would just put a link and then you would get all the scores. But if it's an actual worksheet, um, they're able to pull it up, download it and print it or email it to themselves from the Facebook app. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so we were talking about badges. Um, so these are a couple of the places where you can get the badges and we discussed those. Um, another um, best practice is to uh, provide time, um, timely and useful feedback. So um, I know as we get busy, um, time it becomes harder to grade, especially when you're getting um, assignments 
you know, throughout the whole day, but we need to set up a time um, of when we're going to give the feedback. So students are aware of that. If we're, we have a 24 hour turnaround or if we have a four hour turnaround, it's really up to you, a 48 hour turnaround, but feedback to students about their performance is extremely important in the effort to keep students engaged in the learning journey. Quick responses to discussion posts and email questions can keep students on track for the next assignment or activity. Turnaround time on grading of assessments can also have an impact on future student efforts. Students should never um, have to engage in the next assessment without receiving feedback um, from the first assessment or the previous assessment they did. Feedback that is detailed and positive in nature tends to be more effective than a faint praise or an unkind. So one of the things that I found is when I gave personalized feedback to my students, um, especially my online students that um, are primarily online, um, they love the personalized feedback. Um, they uh, engaged or they worked harder. Sometimes they would ask, can they redo the assignment again? Um, so I think even, um, you know, if they didn't do really well, just providing that positive feedback of, you got two out of 10 correct, but um, let's review the lesson again. I know you can do better. Um, that just kind of gives them that encouragement um, to do it. And especially because when we're working online, they don't see us as often as they used to, um, you know, when we were in the classroom, that um, little comment on their assignment is gonna make a big difference for them. Um, we also want to use different types of feedback. So I know we're used to written feedback because if we're um, typically in the classroom, we're giving written feedback back to our students. Um, and we're also giving face-to-face -face feedback when we do see them. But um, a lot of our tools that we have available now, um, we can send an audio message or you can send a video message for them. Um, so some platforms, um, some learning management systems already have them embedded for you. But even if, um, say for example, you're using um, WhatsApp, so that's like a texting app that you can use with students, um, just doing a little audio message um, kind of uh, makes it more exciting for them and they have to utilize their listening skills to listen to that audio message or a video as well that maybe you uploaded um, into their messaging um, system. So um, one of the things that we do know from research is that research shows that prompt feedback is particularly vital for online students. So that student-teacher interaction um, is going to be so important because students uh, are already feeling um, a little bit isolated or detached when they're not in a face-to-face -face format. So um, keeping a reminder of our student um, interaction and how we can utilize feedback as that interaction process is going to be vital for our students. Another best practice is to add self-assessments and opportunities, um, self-assessment opportunities, allowing students to take more responsibility for their own learning. Creating their own discussion posts can be um, something that they can do or providing input um, for their own participation can be motivating and sometimes a humbling experience for them. A course-based e-portfolio or an e-learning um, plan can be also be used to encourage students to build their own personal learning plans while identifying their present their um, preference for multiple assessment methods. So there's different ways that we can do this. So we want our students to build what are their goals and why um, is this class so important to them and kind of indiv um, individualize that learning. So um, some of the things that uh, I've used um, is portfolio apps and these are other programs that you can also use individually to teach. Um, so there's uh, a few of them. Seesaw is more of a learning journal which provides students and with opportunities for students, teachers to think outside the box so students can show their work and their thought process. I think Seesaw works really well with like intermediate level students and advanced students as well as um, career technical um, and any of the ac more academic courses um, because it really allows them to show their work, their thought process. It, 
provides real time um, submitting video of themselves working through a process. Um, also, maybe a picture. Uh, it encourages them to submit a series of assignments and connects them to them. So it allows for um, peer to peer feedback as well as instructor feedback. Um, you also have another app called VoiceThread, and this app um, is starting to become really popular. It's more of a digital portfolio, which allows both teachers and students to add work samples. It also allows to add images and videos um, right from the app. It accepts multiple um, types of files, um, so it's really accessible. It allows, um, like, live scan, um, scanning of documents, you're able to scan the document and upload it at the same time. Um, and it's a really good um, communication application as well. Um, and the last one that I put up there was Three Rings. So this app, um, it's easy to use. It allows also for both teachers and students to upload work and comment. Um, and it also allows them to review their work and give peer to peer um, feedback. So these are more like um, portfolio apps where students can keep um, as you're uploading um, learning materials for them, like they've created their own account and they can keep it and kind of see um, what they've learned along the way. Um, yes. So could I ask a couple, couple yeah, yeah. questions? Okay. So, um, so I think maybe for these apps specifically, but maybe in general also. Mm -hmm. um, are these apps for free or is there a fee? No, so I've, I've chosen only free apps. So all of these are free apps that you can use. Of course, when we look at free apps, they all have like small limitations, but most of them are pretty open where you can um, have a large amount of students and upload um, you know, as much curriculum as you want. Okay, and then, um, so there's a question, what is a good, well, let's see if you have any thoughts about this. What is a good platform that would allow the teacher to be able to see the work completed? So for example, if you posted a YouTube video for the students to watch, um, you, as the teacher, you'd be able to actually see if the student watched it or not. And maybe this would go for any kind of work that you post for students, if you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, so I'm trying to think, most of the applications don't really tell you if the student watched the video completely or if they clicked on the link. Um, it just tells you if the student marked it as completed. I think what we would use for that is if you do upload like a, a, a small YouTube video, I would use a little assessment with it. So a small assessment, maybe, you know, depends how long you wanna make it, maybe three to five questions asking specific questions about the video. What did they see? Or, um, you know, specifically something that you said in the video so they can answer those questions. That way when they take the assessment, if they didn't watch the video, then they're gonna go back, watch the video and retake the assessment again, um, which would be the hopes. But I can't think of any apps. And if anybody has one, um, please share it in the comments for everyone. Um, if there is an application that tells you if the video was actually watched. Yeah, that, but that is a good idea, though. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you have to watch the video in order to do the work, so. Yeah, so I usually <laughs> always um, pair it up with some type of assessment. Um, and then I know, like, Moodle tracks it, but it's the student completing it, I believe. Melinda? I'm sorry, I was just going to piggyback on both of your answers. There <laughs> is no app that will be able to track if a person has watched the video all the way through. It doesn't exist. However. If you put that video into an app, most apps will allow embeds. I'm gonna use Google Forms as an example. You can put a Google or a YouTube video in a Google Form and have a question right there. So they have to watch it and then they answer the question. Then you post the same video in the next question and they watch it and then they answer the question. So there are a lot of apps that do the same similar thing. So you get your assessment, you know they watched it because you're asking maybe even a weird question like, what color is the cup on the coffee table? They have to watch that video <laughs> in order to see that. It's a very specific thing regarding the video, not just the information. And I'm sorry I interrupted, but- No, no. <laughs> Yesenia, are you, you Yesenia, are you familiar with Edpuzzle? Do you know that 
Um, I haven't used it. I've seen a couple of videos on it, um, but I haven't used it. I think it's almost the same as Edmodo, right? Well, but Ed, I, I actually, that, any of you? Yeah, just to say that the Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle is a, a tech tool you could use. That it's it's very similar to what Melinda just described. I mean, basically, you you could add, for example, a YouTube video, and then you um, what you do is you basically break it at however many points you would like, and then you can ask those kinds of um, comprehension questions, you know, like Melinda was suggesting. So at least you have a sense of the length of the video, right? Because you you know how long the video is, and then you could sort of ballpark, you know, how much time students are spending on questions to, you know, as they're watching the video and completing the activity. So, yeah. And I would just, I would just like to add too, you know, for all of these apps that we're all learning about, um, a, a component that we all should be looking for as we're thinking about, well, can I, should I use this app with my students or not, or this program? Is the is the data right? Are you does the program generate some sort of a report that, as a teacher, we could look at to get some ideas about you know what kind of work are our students doing? Um, you know, you were you mentioned like Kahoot and Quizlet earlier, for example. You, I mean, we know like Kahoot will generate a very simple report mm -hmm. to see you know who answered the questions correctly and who didn't, and that kind of stuff. But in general, that's something that we should all be looking for to, to decide like okay. Should I use this with students or not? Because if I use it, then I'm able to get some data back that will give me some information about, you know, yeah. what my students are actually doing in this program. And even with um, Google Forms, like maybe it doesn't give you, um, you know, like an automatic data sheet, but you can look at the questions that the students answered and determine, you know, how well the students are, are doing. Um, the other, I think there was another question about keyboarding exams. So one of the things that I do to uh, give my students a live keyboarding exam is um, through uh, Zoom. So it's this application. I only have about 22 students, basically all on screen. And I tell them I want a five minute typing test right now. So they all log in, they do the typing test. And I know everybody is on the screen doing the typing test. Um, but they don't get a certificate for that. So usually if there's any certificate attached to it, then we do it a face-to-face -face exam. Okay. Um, our next best practice is, is going to be the microcast. So microcasts are going to basically just be short podcasts or short videos that are um, no more than five minutes. So microcasts can be parts of longer lectures, longer lectures, basically broken down and made into scenarios for students to listen into short burst. Um, or they can be designed to be independent, concise discussion about specific parts of your content. Um, so many students today do their homework while commuting, or they're multitasking, or they have a very short attention span. So microcast um, fits into um, commuting very well or multitasking. Even the most tech savvy students um, like to hear their instructors' uh, voices and they watch short videos. So if we make videos that are too long, it's more than likely that they will not watch them or they won't watch the whole video. So one of those um, reasons is that we want to break up um, as much as we can into small little short pieces of information for them. So they're able to learn something take a small assessment, learn something else, and take another small assessment. And they're able to do that in broken parts, um, especially for our learners right now where they, you know, they're staying at home with their families, they have kids, they're making dinner, they're, they have all of uh, their life responsibilities. So if we just make it a really short activity, five minute video with a two minute um, Q&A, um, that makes it easier for them to get through the curriculum um, and research does show us that microcasting has the same effect as face-to-face um, -face, uh, short lessons. Um, and it can energize online students to keep the level of engagement high. So instead of giving them one long lesson, giving them multiple little small lessons um, can be more effective um, for our students. And to do microcasting, um, some of the applications that I love using um, is really my own phone. Um, you can do your video with your own iPhone or um, any mobile that you have and just download your video into an MP4 file. 
um, and upload it into um, any program that you're using. Um, so really your own phone, if you're used to it and you're comfortable with it, that could be one of your best friends to make your videos. Um, one of the things that I love and I use um, very much, especially for vocabulary learning, is I use PowerPoint with VoiceOver. So PowerPoint has a function where you can add your voice to each individual slide. So this um, makes it really easy for our low-level learners to maybe teach vocabulary. So you have a picture of a chair and you let them know it's a chair, you sound it out for them, you can spell it for them, but each picture would kind of be like a flashcard and you can add uh, your voice to each picture on the PowerPoint. The other ones that I use um, are Loom um, and Screencastify, which are a little bit different, but um, they do the same thing. So basically they're recording your screen. Um, so just like we are right now, you're looking at my screen and hearing my voice in the background. Um, and I know they both have the capacity to show your picture or your video on the side along with your screen. So these are just some uh, of the applications that you can use to create those small micro uh, cast videos or to create any small video that you want to teach for your classroom. So um, for example, when we first, um, you know, had to transition from face to face to online, I just made a daily video of, um, you know, what are we gonna do today? This is the lesson um, you're gonna be learning. Um, posted that and then I posted a separate little video with the specific lesson. Another thing um, that I use the microcast for is a weekly. Um, so maybe just posting your weekly announcements with a video of yourself. Um, kind of help students get to know um, what are they expected to do this week. So these are just some of um, the applications that I use. Um, and as we know, um, really, uh, when we're teaching online, um, a, one of the main benefits that our students are getting from us teaching online right now um, is online learning is the expertise that they're gaining in developing their computer skills. So we're kind of being forced to learn computer skills, um, especially for our older students that weren't used to doing anything online. Um, if they, you know, if they um, want to learn at this point, um, the only way to do it is through video or through online distance because of social distancing. But technology um, can be can foster a rich learning environment that's meaningful and it can create and contribute to all of our students' personal growth and development. Um, so really, I, uh, I encourage you to just take one platform and I know there's so many, um, so many platforms out there and there's so many tools that we can use, but I really encourage you to use one that you're comfortable with, that you're already using and think outside the box on how you can utilize it to teach a mini lesson. If you're already on Facebook, um, let's see, how can I upload a video? Can I create a group for my students? Um, you know, if you're comfortable with uh, Gmail and you can create your Google groups, then that might be the best way to communicate with your students. But I really encourage you just to pick one application. Um, don't uh, pick all of them together because it's going to take a long um, learning process, but pick one application that you like, that you're comfortable with, and utilize it to teach your students or to share um, any learning material that you have for your students. Um, and then I'll take any questions uh, at this point. Um, Uh, Yesenia, we have a so we, we have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, do you, so actually, in the chat, we had a suggestion. Um, okay. It would be great to see an example of a short video telling students about the assignment. Do you happen to have anything you could share? Uh, let me see if I can log into my account. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second, and let me okay. log into my account. And then we did have a couple of questions. Um, in the Q and A, but let's let's see if we can look at this first. Maybe Yesenia, while you're looking for that, in general, you know, how long are these videos that you're sending out to the students? Did you did you want to talk about that as well? Yeah. So the timing, um, I try and do short videos, um, not long. Um, 
the reason um, the short videos are easier for them to manage. Um, so most videos, the recommendation is that they're less than five minutes. Um, so you, and it's easier as a teacher too to record a short video than to do a long one. But as long as your video is less than five minutes, you can keep your students pretty engaged. If um, I'm doing an announcement, um, I usually just uh, make it like two minutes maybe at the most, just kind of introducing the week, saying um, this is what we're going to learn. And um, that's it, you know, and thank them for, for watching it. But other than that, it's a really short video. So I'm logging into my stuff right now. So give me one minute and I'll be able to pull up some stuff. And Yesenia, while you're still looking, mm -hmm. um, just for, for folks who, um, if you're watching the chat, there are a lot, there have been some good suggestions, especially on uh, typing programs. Um, you, we, uh, Yesenia, you talked about typing practice for your students. And mm -hmm. so I think we've had maybe four different suggestions now. Yeah, there's typing, a lot of them out there. Yeah, typing.com, typingweb.com, typingclub.com. And we just got another one in the chat. Oh speedytypingonline.com. So there's a lot of programs out there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I have one video up, the fastest one I can find, because I delete a lot of my videos, but this is one where um, it's just the PowerPoint with voiceover. So let me share that. Remember to hit the share audio button. Hmm. When you there go we go. to share. Yes, I got it. <laughs> So here's one video. Um, so for example, I use this one for um, CTE and it's more of a um, vocabulary video. So I'm just gonna go through it really quickly. Top 10 drugs week one. Lipitor, atorvastatin, used for cholesterol. Nexium, esomeprazole, for use for GERD or stomach, Plabix, Clopidogrel, used as a blood thinner, stroke, or heart. So that's a quick example of um, what one of my videos um, looks like. And if you look at this uh, video, um, I'm giving them 10 um, vocabulary words. Um, so, for example, this is for a career technical class where they have to memorize uh, the drug um, and they have to memorize what it's used for. So, I, I'm giving them 10 drugs um, and it's basically a simple PowerPoint. Um, and this uh, video is only a minute and 44 seconds. Um, so, what my students use it for um, is to memorize um, those vocabulary words. And what I've been told is my students listen to it in the car, they listen to it, you know, as much as they can, because for them it's more helpful to listen to the pronunciation. Um, and uh, they're really short. So then after they've mastered um, the flashcards that I gave them through the video, I usually have a really quick um, assessment that's more like a matching assessment where they match um, the words and the uses. Um, I'm trying to see if I, I can't find a video of myself and um, so I can share that with you. Um, but yes. that would be what a PowerPoint looks like. Okay. And you're saying, um, which I'm not sure, I'm not sure what um, tech you're using to create the PowerPoint. I mean, that your hardware, but a couple of questions. Um, do you know um, how to add voiceover on in slides using an iPhone or a Mac? Um, if you um, are using the PowerPoint app, it should be in the same place. So, for example, um, let me share my screen. And so, for example, this is PowerPoint. Um, if you're using the app, I, I've done it on my iPad before. So, you go to insert. Um, at the home ribbon, you go to the insert ribbon, and then on the right 
um, there is an audio or a video clip. So you can upload video if you want. Um, I usually like doing the audio for flashcards, only audio. So when you click on audio, it asks you if you want to use the audio from your computer or whatever you're using, the device that you're using, or if you're uploading like an audio file um, or if you want to record it. So the program itself will ask you um, whether you're, you're recording from the device or whether you're uploading like an MP3 file that you did on your, I mean, MP4 file that you did on your phone. Or, is that correct, Anthony? What is it called if it's just an audio MP? The audio, I believe, is only MP3, but the okay. MP4 would be the, yeah, would the be like video. The video. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, sometimes what we, you can do the audio separate and then upload it, or you can do um, the audio with uh, the program itself, which is PowerPoint. And like I said, I've done it on my iPad, um, and it works um just as well as the computer so if you're just using your your ipad then it should work or your iphone so yesenia um a different question speaking of devices <laughs> um do you have some so here that question was in the q a do you have some information that could be shared as to what devices students must have in order to use the different apps that you've talked about so for example some students only have phones so i think it's rather than must have it's just you know what devices they have yeah. so so can you talk a little bit about you know the the variety of devices that students have and how you maybe address some of those technical issues that might come up uh, most of the applications that i shared today are accessible through any mobile device as long as it's like a you know a mobile uh a current mobile phone, um, not like the small flip phones that we used to have before, but most applications are very user friendly on their phones. Um, so they should be able to access them, even if, um, you know, the website apps um, to build a portfolio, if um, you're going to be doing um, uploading lessons that way, they're accessible through the phone. So I don't think any of our students should have any um, issues as far as accessing um, any of the applications that we talked about today through the phone. I know that sometimes people ask, you know, if students are watching a lot of videos, for example, you know, does that somehow, you know, impact their uh, data usage or if they're on a plan that, you know, is tracking minutes or something like that. So that might be, um, that might be an issue for some yeah. students though. Yeah, we had a, sorry, Yesenia, we had a suggestion um, in one of our office hours, I think last week, for example, that sometimes maybe a first step, and I think you talked about this a little bit in the beginning as well, is maybe the first step is just making sure as the teacher, you survey your students to find out, well, what is it that, you know, what technology mm -hmm. do they have at their disposal before you, you know, unleash whatever it is you want to yeah. do with them, right? Yeah, definitely. I think just taking their input or even asking your students, what apps are you already using, you know, to to engage with others um, and just kind of seeing, you know, if you have a lot of students using a specific app, then that would be a great app, you know, to kind of consider or modifying it to use to teach students or send out messages to them. Um, so, Yusenia, back on the PowerPoint, we've, we have a couple of questions now in the um, Q and A. Uh, a question: Which PowerPoint app do you recommend to upload on our phone? It's the Microsoft. What I have on my iPad is just the Microsoft app. So if you go to Microsoft, your um, store, you should be able to access Microsoft PowerPoint, and it's uh, the app for specifically for PowerPoint. And if you already have an account that you're logged in with or that you use for your school district then you're able to log in with that account. And then um, back on the device question. Um, so for example, the difference between students who have, um, uh, you know, iPhones or any kind of iOS device versus an Android device. And if there are differences in, in uh, what they're seeing or the experience or anything like that. Do you happen to know about that? That might be a question for you, Anthony, because I feel like <laughs> they all kind of look the same, um, right? Uh, when it's configured to like a computer to a phone, 
um, it looks a little bit different between the computer and a phone, but as far as phone differences itself, I'm not quite sure on that. Yeah, Mel I don't know if Melinda wants to chime in on, uh, <laughs> on that one either. Most apps or websites will have responsive design right. included. So the information will all be there. When you're on a computer, you'll see everything. But as you go to a smaller device like a tablet or a phone, it's going to move around a little bit. So you need to be aware of that when you're telling your students, go to the menu. And if they're using it on their phone, where's the menu? <laughs> because it won't be where you see it if you're using your computer. So the best, the best suggestion I can come up with is to actually um, install the app, see what it does so that you can describe it to your students. And I would just add to, um, yes, to what Melinda said, two things. One is, um, no, I can't remember the second, but the first was, um, yeah, it's very helpful. I think just in general, a good, a good practice or a best practice is it to actually, oh, that's what I was going to say, is to, um, yeah, if you have a mobile device, I mean, make sure you as the teacher first, you know, do whatever it is that you are creating, right? So, and that my other point was sometimes there, there are differences between sort of the desktop laptop computer version of the program and the app version. So I know, for example, you mentioned um, Poll Everywhere and um, the Poll Everywhere experience will um, look different than it will look on a computer, for example. So it's always helpful, you know, if you have a computer at home if you and if you have a tablet or a mobile device or whatever it is, as you you know, as a teacher, and then do create it as the teacher, and then experience it as the student on your device. So, as Melinda was saying, you know, these questions are going to come up for from our students because they don't always know, you know, where to look for the menu or how to move around on their phone or whatever it is. So. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, to uh, be part of this webinar um, and thank you for joining us. Um, I don't know if Anthony or Melinda have anything else, but I'm, I'm, unless there's any more questions, I think I'm done. Yeah, let me just, uh, we did have a question. There was a question in the chat, uh, sorry, in a chat about, um, and actually <laughs> that's funny because Yesenia, Melinda and I were talking about this right before the session about, well, what if I'm, what about Google Slides, for example, right? Because you've been talking a lot about PowerPoint. Basically, can I do the same kinds of things in Google Slides? And I don't know if maybe Melinda wants to chime in on that one as well, too. Uh, Melinda will chime in, but uh, with, with the caveat that um, Google Slides is not PowerPoint. And right now, no, it doesn't have an audio record function like PowerPoint. However, it does have apps that will do the recording, like Keep, and then you can insert those audio files into a, a slide. So it's, it's done a different way. Um, and you'll find that there's some things that you can do really easy in Google Slides that eh, not so much on, on the PowerPoint. So each have their, uh, their pluses, their pros, I should say, and their cons. Um, we are going to be scheduling an, a webinar in the future on how to do some Google slide stuff. So I'm not going to give you too much more information because I don't want to take away from that presentation. Um, I and I just shared a, a link, to Linda, that gives them um, step-by-step -step on how to put audio into Google slides. Thank you. So I looked it up. So yeah, um, yeah it can be done like a just a easy. different way. Uh, it looks quick and easy, but I think we would have to um, look at it. It's probably a little bit different than PowerPoint, but um, it can be done. Definitely. All so right. you're saying, yeah, oh, sorry, Melinda. So you're saying now a few, a couple more questions in the Q&A. Um, so um, you presented on a lot of apps today um, and, uh, you know, a lot of things to, for stu uh, teachers to think about. So do you have any suggestions where you might start, you know, especially if it's a teacher and students who are just kind of getting, you know, they're getting oriented to online learning and things like that? And maybe things that, from the student's point of view, might be, be, might be easier things to start with, for example. Um, so we just had this conversation. Um, with, we had a meeting with um, my school district. Um, 
and our adult ed teachers felt that the easiest um, start was kind of Zoom um, to kind of get the students online and just kind of face to face and be able to show different things. Um, and some of the teachers really felt that the messaging apps like Remind was one of the favorites that came out amongst the group, that it was easy, it was fast, um, students are able to respond right away. Um, so those were the two that came out um, from a group of teachers, you know, that were, were learning and kind of trying to transition to online. Um, but I think, uh, like we talked about earlier, is um, picking an app that you're a little bit comfortable with and kind of maximizing the use of it. So if you're comfortable with a social media outlet already, um, trying to see if we can get our students to um, join our group um, and deciding which one you're going to use. Um, and start there, start with only one, right? Um, and start sharing with them as much as you can. Um, so I think um, somebody shared that their ABE students um, use the Remind app and they feel that it's easy um, because they choose whether to receive messages as text or as emails and all of the students use it. So yeah, Remind is um, a really popular app from teachers. Great. Um, a couple of other recommendations on, or uh, suggestions on Remind as well. Um, Melinda, you, do you happen to have a Google form <laughs> open on your computer? There's a question about that setting. I, so I there was, there was uh, a question. Yeah, yeah. Hang, hang on. <laughs> we're we're kind of going off in different tangents here, and we want to have a really clean video, and we're okay. creating a lot of stuff at the end that we're going to have to cut out which actually makes the video creation longer so the forms answer is within settings um i do have a form open but i'm i'm not going to show it because we have an office hours coming up at four o'clock <laughs> if you'd like to see that in action come to the otan office hours and we can show you anything you want no worries okay but anthony i think we should um if things are winding down yesenia if you are comfortable yeah. with okay I think we should wind this down and Anthony, if you want to do the OTAN how to's while everyone starts typing in their name and their agency. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Samia. So yeah, we just wanted to, um, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Uh, just to remind people about, and let me go to the OTAN website um, about, there's some questions about, you know, about the slides and recordings and things like that. So if you go to the OTAN website, which is OTAN.us, uh, what you'll see is our top story on the home page, which has a link, uh, sorry, which has a list of the upcoming webinars for the week. Um, it's already, gosh, it's Wednesday today. Um, we still have some more things coming up. Uh, Melinda mentioned our office hours today. So our office hours on Wednesdays are from four o'clock to five o'clock. We also have an office hour on Friday, which will start at 10 in the morning, and we will have an office hour on Monday, which starts at one in the afternoon. Uh, we do have a webinar coming up, actually later this afternoon at one o'clock on Padlet. Um, some people are interested in learning more about Padlet, so we do have a one o'clock uh, webinar on that. Uh, Monica Espinoza will present about um, using Padlet to engage learners online. Uh, we have another CASAS training or CASAS webinar coming up tomorrow afternoon. I believe it's also one o'clock. You can register for that, Recording Distance Learning in TOPS Pro. And then um, on Friday, Melinda and Debbie are going, Debbie Jensen are going to do um, actually part one of Google Classroom, um, how to get started with Google Classroom if you're interested in that. Um, part two will be Monday uh, next week. And I believe the time is 10 a.m. for both of those sessions. So make sure you come to the OTAN website to get a list of the upcoming webinars for the week. And then while you're here on the right side, go ahead and click on that COVID-19 field support button, which will take you to a dedicated page where we're trying to really kind of centralize a lot of resources that we feel would be helpful for the field um, to know about. So uh, if you scroll down this page, we have actually a link to an OTAN resource guide, it has a lot of ideas, and we try to organize it by topics as well. So for example, like if you're interested in video, you can take a look at that resource guide and see the video um, uh, recommendations and suggestions we have there. 
Um, again, if you want to view upcoming webinars, you'd want to go to the California Adult Ed Training Calendar. Um, you can see, actually, we have also webinars scheduled for next week as well. So if you want to start looking at those webinars, get some ideas what's coming up. And then on this page, we have this previous OTAN webinars table where we're trying to post uh, both recordings and any resources that presenters share during their, pre uh, during their webinars. So starting, uh, starting on March 17th, that was the very first one we gave, but we have actually a number of webinars that we've presented over the last couple of weeks. So come here to be able to download the slides, um, view the recordings when we get them up. I think Melinda mentioned we are a little behind, backlogged on the recordings, but we're trying to get them up as soon as we can. Uh, we, do, we do make things accessible um, on the website, so it does take a little doing to um, get everything accessible for, um, so that we uh, are following those guidelines. So um, we also have resources from CalPro, um, resources from CASAS. Actually, CASAS, you might want to take a look at this if, you're, if you have questions about CASAS testing, um, EL civics testing, all that kind of stuff. Actually, CASAS um, commented, commented on the Octay memo that came out last week about the standardized testing. Um, we also have uh, information from CDE, from the Adult Ed Office, and then we have a few other things here on the bottom as well. So make sure that you come to the OTAN website, again, OTAN.us, the homepage start there uh, for our webinar information for the week, and then you can also visit our field support page as well.